Okay, um, I'm going to have you all stand up and we're going to go outside of the grapes. So we're going to start from there. So uh, I do a lot of tours out here with Frank and Elha, and a lot of times during the winter months we get farmers from the U.S. mainland to come through. And the first thing I ask the farmers is, are you fearful or do you fear climate change? Do you fear drought? And raise your hand. And most of them raise their hand. And I go ahead and say, well, I don't raise my hand because I do not fear drought. I do not fear global climate change. In fact, I may be the only business around that who actually embraces it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's going on here is I have five wine vines that were planted in 1997 down at the Natural Energy Lab, all the way down by the ocean. Um, they were brought in as uh, stock and we put them on the cold ag patent technology, and I'm gonna go into that. The cold ag patent technology has two things going for it. One, it's producing an endless spring environment. And what I mean by endless spring is what happens in, the, in temperate climates is that during the summertime, the air temperature is hot and the soils are relatively warm, okay? Come autumn or fall, the air temperatures start to drop, but the soils are still warm. They're, they lag behind because soil is a good insulator, okay? Come winter time, the air temperature is cold and the soils are relatively close to being the same temperature cold, okay? So there's very little thermal differential between the root zone and the leaf zone of the plant, okay? Come spring, however, the soils are still cold, but the air is warming up very fast because you get a logarithmic growth of this daylight cycle, okay? Hence, in Alaska and northern climates, you get this rapid growth. You get spring bloom, okay? I'm able to create that spring bloom here in the tropics 365 days a year and the capacity to turn it on and off when I want to. Okay, most of the biological thinking of plant physiology thinks of dormancy as a time period when the plant is basically loses all its leaves and it goes into a, a hibernation state. Okay, usually that's during the winter time. There's no thermal differential between the root and the leaf in the winter time. Same thing in the summertime, not much difference between the root and the leaf. But come spring, when you have that differential, in nature, of about 5 to 10 degrees, you get this rapid growth, okay? And rapid flowering, okay? Things flower very fast in the springtime. These vines were pruned back all the way down to the second node uh, about three and a half weeks ago. So this is actually three weeks worth of growth. And as you can see, there's already uh, grapes already on the vine. Okay, flowers, and in 120 days, I will be harvesting, turn them off, and restart them. Okay, photo period does not play a role here. In Hawaii, we only get two hours of difference between winter and summer. There's not really a spring and a fall. Okay, I can turn these things on and off at will. So, technically, I can have a rotation of different types of plants in different phases of production, all in the same piece of property, 365 days a year, okay? That's one aspect of the technology. The other aspect is that I don't fear drought. And what I mean by drought is that we have to wait for it to rain. I'm actually making it rain. Now, if you saw it, it's actually dripping water as we speak, 
okay? I'm actually condensing water out of the atmosphere. In the tropics, the relative humidity is very high, um, 50, 60%, okay, relatively on the average. Um, that corresponds to be about six milliliters of water for every cubic meter of air. That's a lot of water. And so what we do now is run cold water through the, the soil to create the cold spring-like condition, but then also that same soil comes above it and gives it drip-wise irrigation 24-7. And actually, it's not 24-7. This place actually shuts its water off at 7 o'clock at night, so it actually goes dry. So this is one aspect of the technology that I bring to the table, and I call this super spring. It's a hybrid of the cold ag pattern. And I'll go back and start from the beginning. But I wanted to bring you all out here to see this prior to it getting dark and have an idea of what, what I am talking about. So if you want, you can feel this. This is cold. It's just like a, a cold glass of water. Um, water comes in and water goes out. So between the difference between the water coming in and go, going out, it's about two degrees drop in temperature or, or raise in temperature. Where's this one go? It goes out to the drywall. So this is one aspect using seawater, okay? Originally, all the technology that we developed here was related to a deep ocean water pipe. Um, my next move commercially is actually to get off the pipe. And so if you want, we all go back inside and I'll start the talk. There's no effluent per se, it's just the same stuff. Right, I'm not touching it. No? So what goes out could go to aquaculture. So dew point system addresses three major concerns in the, in the world today. Energy is one, that's what uh, OTEC is looking at. Uh, solar farms are looking at uh, solving some of the energy problems, but food and water are also very critical in that whole equation. And they're all interrelated. So if I told you I can produce agricultural crops out in the desert with no water, only using the sunlight. Climate change did not affect me. In fact, I embrace climate change because as global warming increases, humidity level <laughs> in the world increases. That means there's more water to capture in the, in the atmosphere. I can produce more crops than anybody else per year in a rotational basis. I can conserve soil. In fact, we've demonstrated we can actually manufacture soil using this technology by bringing together uh, organics, uh, microbes, moisture, and volcanic minerals. We can actually, over a period of time, and we've documented this, that we can actually produce healthy soils. If you left that soil, same soil out without being cool or moist, it would basically turn to dust and blow away into the planet. So the moisture content and the microbes and having the capacity to have a cool soil supports the microbes in the, in the soil and actually helps create soil in the long term. We can also go ahead and take a desert area that has no production capability, basically either through a lack of water or a lack of soil or a number of other things. Maybe there's salt in the water brine water. They don't even have access to fresh water like, say, the New Mexico desert. We can also use uh, deep ocean water as far as a energy source to drive our systems. In fact, there's a number of uh, installations that are, are being planned around the world that are looking at deep ocean water primarily uh, for tomorrow for seawater air conditioning. That's the biggest one. And then in the future generations is OTEC, um, which might be mostly offshore, like uh, what is pictured here, okay? But for land-based 
operations. Seawater air conditioning is a, a big one. Um, seawater air conditioning can go ahead and reduce the amount of energy required in cooling by 90% using deep ocean water. That's a big one, okay? In the tropics, the most expensive thing to do is to cool something down. Deep ocean water is, is a great resource for that. So you can see that they're pumping in seawater. Uh, they have an OTEC plant here uh, making fresh water. They also have the ag already in the corporation, and then they have a heat exchanger here for seawater air conditioning. So the technology that Dewpoint system has, it's written into a lot of business plans that are being developed around the world for coastal developments. Another thing that uh, we're looking at is how to get off the deep ocean water pipe in expanding the applications to diversify agriculture here in the state, and that's looking at solar thermal energy. Um, solar thermal energy has had a little hit recently. The big power plants in California, I don't you notice the big solar cells they have out in the Mojave Desert, the largest solar plants in the world. Well, environmentalists have been hitting them recently because apparently migratory birds don't like to fly through heavy rays of solar radiation and have knocked out quite a few birds in their migratory paths. So they've been getting a lot of bad PR lately on mega scale plant solar plants for generating electricity. One of the biggest problems over here, and Dean can probably contest to that, is that in solar thermal energy production for electricity. You're taking a liquid and superheating it to basically create steam and run a traditional generation system of electricity. That has a lot of moving parts and has a lot of, I don't know, you got to go ahead and have solar thermal backup storage. Okay, so that be 24-7 reliable, you got to have a sizable storage capacity for an operation like that. For coupling this technology to dew point systems technology, it's a little different. The soil in the ground is, that we're creating is cold, and soil is a good insulator. So in essence, I don't need to have 24-7 cold. I only need 12. During the nighttime, the soil doesn't lose a lot of, or gain a lot of heat. It's actually getting cooler, it stays cool because radiation is, is, is the other way around. So the whole system that we've developed is now that we can actually couple with solar thermal and get away from the battery 24 seven uh, energy production mode of solar thermal and actually now go into production of just creating cold during the daytime hours. Okay, and the way you generate cold through solar thermal is with an uh, absorption chiller. An absorption chiller takes, uh, is uh, all of you are old enough to understand, propane stove or, or propane refrigerators. Okay, you light the pilot light and the refrigerator gets cold. Same technology has been used for hundreds of years. has now been refined enough that opens up an opportunity for our technology to get off the deep ocean water pipeline and now go into, say, a desert climate and actually do it. As OTEC comes on board, um, we can also use the residual energy that OTEC is not using. Uh, a lot of the discharge from seawater air conditioning systems that are planned and OTEC will have a discharge temperature of 55 degrees Fahrenheit. That's well within the re range of capturing moisture from the air. And another thing that our technology allows is, again, back to the remote capacity to, to take and utilize land that's non-productive, okay, especially in remote areas like Hawaii, where we have to actually have to import all the food that we bring. Well, I'd say not all, but 80% of the food that's consumed in the state is actually imported. So I kind of alluded to the, out there by the grapes, the two areas that the technology uh, is based on. And it's based on one I call biothermal energy. And that's the, the phenomenon of creating an endless springtime connection, okay? Having the cold roots and having a warm leaf uh, zone, okay? 
gives you this spontaneous growth, this, this springtime bloom growth, okay? And we can also regulate that by turning on and off our cold thermal energy. The other one is I, I say is two prong is low thermal energy. And low thermal energy meaning that I don't need to have freezing temperatures. I just need to have temperatures that are just 10 degrees below dew point, okay? That's a manageable temperature to achieve. And that the temperature allows us to capture the water from the air, okay? And then the other technology is the atmospheric water generation. So here's a graph from Honolulu with the average dew point temperature. Does everybody know what dew point temperature means? It's based on several things. It's based on atmospheric pressure, which here we're at sea level, so it's pretty much a constant, okay? It changes if you go up, up in elevation. It's also based on the humidity and the temperature, okay? It's based on dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures, okay? If the air temperature is, say, 75 degrees and the humidity is at 75 degrees, you will have a dew point temperature very close to 75 degrees. That's called saturation, okay? So right here in Hawaii, typically our temperatures run about 12 degrees below, above the humidity level. So if it's 80 degrees outside, it's about, oh, 68 degrees, 68% uh, humidity. Okay. Dew point would be rough, roughly around that temperature. Okay, so you can see that the the high range is all the way up into the upper 70s. In fact, in here in September, it was probably uh, 74 degrees dew point temperature. That's pretty muggy. It's pretty sticky outside. And the low temperatures are you know, around 59 or so. Some of them get down to 55. So when I was saying 55 degrees is all I need, really, that's about all I need. Okay. At 59, we're, we're four degrees below dew point. That's a, um, probably right in the middle of the afternoon. Here's a graph on humidity. And granted, our technology can't work everywhere, like in a really, really dry climate of a, of a desert, inland desert, okay? But a lot of places in the world have humidity levels that are quite high. Here we can see in Hawaii, it ranges from 90 to 79% humidity. So that allows us the opportunity to take advantage of atmospheric water generation. So going back to the two points that, that make our technology, it's biothermal energy, I call it, and a low thermal energy. And so one of the technologies that, well, one of the things that we do in reducing our cost of, of implementing our technology is that we use cheap materials and off-the-shelf materials. And um, this was pounded in my head by Dr. Craven. Don't think metallic, okay? Think plastics. Plastics, you think, oh, do not have a good heat exchanging capacity, okay? I'm not worried about that because in the, in the equation of heat, uh, um, exchange T for time, I don't care about time. It can take me two days to get the thing cold. I don't care. But once it's cold, it's boiled and it insulated. Okay, it stays cold very easily. And here you can see the temperature gauge is at 52 degrees. So going back to what I said out there by the grapes, there's a number of different uh, things that thermal energy agriculture. One's the difference between the root and the leaf zone. A cool soil acts as a condenser to condense the atmospheric water vapor. If the soil itself is below the dew point, it is a condenser. It will get wet, okay? If it's wet and below the dew point, you have no evaporation either. So what's interesting about the technology is that we're only have to condense as much water as the plants actually require. So only have to use as much energy to do that. So there's no waste of energy as far as loss to evaporation. We can grow temperate plants in the tropical climate, okay? 
We've tried a number of tropical plants uh, with the systems and they just don't work. And partly because evolutionary in genetics, they've grown to adapt to warm climates. Put them in a cold climate, they shrink down and climb up. They don't, they don't grow at all. Um, there are a couple plants that have shown some capability of growing in cool roots, and that was lily corn. That was a good one that we found. Also, what we found is that nutritional and aromatic flavor content is very high. Um, the grapes uh, use a bricks uh, scale for measuring the sugar content. And these are an Isabella wine, old world wine grape. And ideal uh, bricks content was 15 for that. We were right, getting between 13 and 16. So that was root right, right at 15. Also with the agricultural uh, component, we can go ahead and take advantage of land that's non-productive. Either land that's not suitable for traditional agricultural practices. And we can go ahead and grab that water from the air. Say like out here, there's no one really growing anything out here, but we could. And we demonstrated right there with the grapes. Also, we're looking at diversifying and complementing agriculture production, not trying to compete with traditional farming. We're, we can grow things that they cannot, okay? We can help offset a lot of the imports coming into the state that the farmers can't grow. So that provides us another opportunity. We also are organic farming compatible, okay? A lot of the stuff that I'm working on now has a lot more control over their environment. And as such, can uh, battle more of the pests and, and be more organic in, the, in our production methods. And then also uh, using alternative energies, uh, we can drive our systems. Um, again, not having any fresh water well, you're, you can't do agriculture. Having enough sunlight, I can't. So here we are in thermal energy or atmospheric water generation. A couple points here. Um, atmospheric water vapor is pretty much universally available. I can go a mile down the road and I get as much down there as I can go 10 miles down the road over there in certain re regions. And then also, by generating the fresh water on site, you don't have to worry about distribution systems. Uh, in fact, a lot of the renewable energies now are starting to go into modular self containers going on roof, rooftops instead of a massive solar farm to generate to the grid. And that's more of the trend nowadays. And then also atmospheric water is very stable, pretty much uh, year round, okay, in tropical climates. In some climates it might go up and down a little bit, but if you're near an ocean, there's enough atmospheric water vapor pretty much year round. So back to, uh, this is the technologies we have patented. Uh, we have the cold ag patent, uh, which I'm a co-owner of that with Dr. Craven and Dr. Jack Davidson. Dr. Craven is formerly the chief scientist of the US Navy and the founder of the Natural Energy Lab here in NOHA. Jack Davidson was formerly the director of the Sea Grant College Program. And my wife and I were brought on board in 2000 to work for them. And Got, got the thing to a path. Um, the Super Spring, which is the grapes, uh, is a hybrid of the coal ag patent, which has now uh, above the plant drip irrigation. And then Duponics, which I have a registered trademark for, is what I'm doing down at Nelha in, my, in the R&D section at the research compound. And I'll get into that a little bit. And then the rain dome system, is a patented system that I patented. Um, it's basically a very large heat exchanger or a condenser that moves water through numerous condensers via siphon, okay? And that siphon flow is regulated by the dew point. And so we've been using a lot of uh, computer SCADA sensors now that are now able to 
automate some of this stuff and actually fluctuate some of the flow rates of the water based on dew point fluctuations during the daytime. So that saved a lot of energy. So the cold ag patent, uh, this is Dr. Craven here sitting in his garden. That's down where Sig Crawl have, has his place now. And Dr. Jack Davidson is playing on what we call the eco turf, which we grew some very nice grass. And this is actually a plot of soil from the Republic of the Marshall Islands that was uh, mailed it to us. And uh, we had to autoclave it. And then we rejuvenated it by putting it on top of the coal bag system and planting crops. And the uh, president of the Marshall Islands at the time, Tessé Note and his cabinet, came out and blessed, blessed their soil and ate from their plot of land. So that was really nice. And this is Dr. Craven again under some cabbage. As you can see, the cabbage grow like they were in Alaska, but here we are in Hawaii. The Super Spring Ag is, again, the, a hybrid of the cold ag technology, uh, which I've developed. And, uh, and looking at trying to expand that here, possibly working with the solar plant over here and doing a closed loop system with an absorption chiller. So you can see that uh, the grapes are, are nice uh, by changing the soil climate. I actually force them to ripen. And so that's uh, a unique uh, thing about the grapes. Uh, Duponics is what I'm doing now as R&D down at the research compound. We're incorporating a SCADA, which is a supervisory control and data acquisition programming. So what I'm getting, I got sensors in with the lettuce, which goes to a, a control module, which then it sends Wi-Fi to my iPad, and I can go ahead and see exactly what's going on with my production systems on the iPad. <coughs> and then also we get uh, real-time data collection that actually can graph that out and stores all the data, which is very nice. It's, it, it, you don't have to go down there and write all the data down anymore, so that's just wonderful. The rain dome system is uh, one of my jewels, which in California, they're really hurting for water and they're looking at any opportunity to do anything about water. Um, so I've been getting a little bit of inquiries now about uh, developing a prototype of, uh, with the rain dome. And the rain dome basically is uh, a, a modular uh, system that's using uh, called serrated thin uh, helical tub tubing for heat exchanging. And you can see there's a number of them, and these things go all the way down. You can go ahead and stack this thing up. So what happens is take cold water on one side, and you can draw that water past all these heat exchangers by lowering one side down and causing a siphon. And the flow rate here would regulate based on the temperature of the dew point. So air comes into the system, comes up, and goes past the coils. The water is dripping off the coils, goes into a trough, and then out, and then the air would actually be evacuated, which would be a cool, dry air, which can actually be used for air conditioning. So the system can actually be stacked and modulated out into a big, big, uh, big uh, system. So going with this, it was designed originally for deep ocean water technology, is, is the cold energy, but now we're looking at using the absorption chiller to generate cold in a closed loop system where we'd have a chiller at each elevation. So now the water is only running at one elevation, you're not pumping water up and down. So that's the big energy saving there. And actually generating the water at this level, okay, also you're saving energy as far as head pressure. So where am I with my technology today? The cold ag, it's been, it's patented. We beta tested and small prototype tested here at Melha over 20 years. Um, that technology is pretty much ready for scale up, commercializing. Um, applications are vegetables, herbs, ornamental fruits, horticulture, turf grass. Um, the other technology, the super spring, which is the hybrid of the cold, is something that's pretty much uh, started in 2010 when I moved the grapevines up, up here to the gateway system. 
for Gateway Center. That's ready for uh, commercial scale up also. Um, I want to go ahead and try other types of grapes, and um, wine grapes is what Dr. Davidson and, and Dr. Craven initially started because they wanted to have the fruits and, and, and the liberty of their, of their pursuits, okay? <laughs> but uh, to make wine is a whole other commercial venture, and I'm not willing to go there. Uh, I'll drink wine off the, out of a bottle from someone else. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, table grapes is a big one. Uh, table grapes are high in antioxidants and are uh, another item that the state imports a lot of. And uh, a lot of the restaurants wanted to have uh, locally grown grapes uh, as garnish on their salads and stuff like that. Another one was currants. I was told by the, the chefs on this coast that currants made in, uh, to, for making sauces are, are a big thing. The Duponics is a, a registered trademark. I'm currently uh, applying for a patent on that one. Uh, I've been uh, testing that now for two years here at Nelha. Um, it's ready for prototype scale up, okay? It's not really commercialized just yet. Um, the applications are basically fast turnaround crops. I'm planning on growing crops that uh, uh, hydroponic guys cannot grow, okay? So soil based crops. The technology is a little different than the cold ag technology. The duponics is modular approach. It's more tabletop like uh, hydroponics, okay? I'm only chilling the amount of soil that the plant requires. Whereas cold ag was chilling a plot of land, it also brought in uh, a huge amount of pests, okay, into an oasis. They, they find you. You, know, you try to get a, a get a pest in an oasis, it's very difficult. So, growing plants in only the amount of soil that they require helps reduce the amount of pest management you have to clear up in the long run. It also amount, uh, reduces the amount of soil you actually have to have on site. Also, the cold ag patent, um, being a plot of soil in the ground, you had to actually till it. Okay? Um, tilling around seawater tends to break pipes and you get seawater. So there are some disadvantages to that. Growing in smaller containers allows you to not till the soil, but actually recycle the soil between each crop. Okay, and recycle it into a uh, viticulture or a, a, a worm culture uh, type of environment to rejuvenize the soil and then bring it back to, to grow. And that, that also breaks the, the pest cycle also. And then the rain dome system is patented. Um, individual components have been tested, but not a scalable effort has been tested at this point in time. Uh, again, California is very interested in doing some of that work. The directives of viewpoint system is to look for strategic partners and then street, uh, strategic investors. We also want to couple our intellectual property with ocean solar, geothermal, photovoltaic energy systems to basically get ourselves off the deep water pipeline and out into very remote applications. Um, we're looking to demonstrate a two, three, two to three acre model here at Nelha utilizing our technologies. That will also be doing more R&D work, but also as a training center, as more Opportunities develop as more deep water pipelines are being deployed. Uh, there is a big project in the Bahamas that has a um, seawater air conditioning system that's already built for on the ground for seawater air conditioning. They're now just waiting for the engineering and the pipe to be deployed. So that's a, a destination that's um, on the radar. Uh, Japan has a number of pipelines that are already in. Taiwan already has a couple pipelines that are, are going in. Um, one actually to service a, a new university that's being developed all around deep ocean water technology. So what we want to do is actually be a training facility also on top of R&D. So as these other sites are, are, are being developed, we can actually train people to start running those facilities. 
So what's our benefits? Well, we can use clean renewable energies to run our systems. Uh, we open up new agricultural opportunities and diversifying for regions that are not productive or diversifying current agricultural production. Uh, again, we're climate change resilient. In fact, uh, I don't want to say it, but I do welcome climate change. Uh, secure water resources from atmospheric water. Basically, it's universally found. It's easily tapped in tropical environments. Our agricultural technology has shown that we can actually increase the nutritional content of certain items using the cold ag technology. And also, we found that it's reliable. We've been doing this now for a number of years with not any problems. Uh, some of the wine experts in California thought that dormancy was required by the plants between cycles, so they would store energy for the next crop. Well, I shot that out the window because uh, we've been these crops or these grapes have been doing three crops a year for almost 15 years now, and so long as you provide them enough nutrients, they don't need enough stored energy. They can get their energy from the nutrients inside. <clears throat> so, Dew Point System has had several projects going on. We have the, the grape vines that we show up there. I got the research going on at the research compound. Um, prototype development in California, the Rain Dome. And then I've also been working with uh, Sandia National Labs in New Mexico. They are doing tests on the cold ag technology and in greenhouses on their campus and have just given me the thumbs up that the technology they found works. And that's a big, big uh, endorsement by Sandia National Labs. In fact, they're going to go to phase two uh, research next year on this and it will be published in the Fair Journal. Um, I've also done some consulting work in Taiwan and other places in the world. And uh, like I say, countries that are smaller than the U.S., their timeline for the last drop of oil is shorter than ours. They're much more progressive in looking at al alternatives right now than the U.S. And so I see actually for technology development for dew point system is probably more outside the U.S. than it is in, inside the U.S. right now. Some of the commercialization hurdles for our technology is that we've been exclusively developed around a seawater pipeline. And that's one of the things that has hindered our development because there's not many people in pipelines around the world at this point in time. They're still planned for many of them going up in Guam and to, there's one in Tahiti and, and other places, but not at this point in time are they available for commercialization of my technology. A lack of commercial scale prototypes have also been my hurdle. I need to get out to some place where I actually can scale this stuff up and actually show that it actually works. Hopefully that will happen around next door here. And I've had pretty much limited investment. It's pretty much been out of my own pocket. So I've got a few pictures of stuff I just collected today. Um, some radishes that we were grown down the R&D R Center down in Minnehaha. A little picture of uh, how DuPonics might look um, on a model scale. Um, three crops a year. A year. Um, this is what it looked like just three weeks ago. You can see it the, all the way down the ground. That's 120 days of growth. Um, the sugar content is very high. So I think we can compete on that level. Having an endless springtime, we've actually been able to grow flowers year round, spring, endless spring. So possibly seed manufacturers might be interested in doing this because they can produce seed, st seed stock all, all year round. And here's uh, my son, <coughs> actually here's my daughter. <laughs> so you can see I've been around here for a while here at Nelha. My son is this tall. Carrots, we were able to grow carrots. There's not many people grow carrots in the state of Hawaii. Um, turf grass is another one that we did. Um, 
bent grass, um, and also preferred fescue rye soccer grass. Um, there's a couple of nice uh, species that other people in Hawaii can't grow because it's too warm. And uh, that concludes it. I'm sure there's questions. Wow. Well, okay. Uh, I first read about using, uh, getting anticlinic atmospheric water about 20 years ago. The Army was buying portable chiller units yes. that could extract water in the desert. Yes. And I think they would get like 11 gallons of water for burning one gallon of diesel fuel. Yes. So that's good logistics for the military. Yeah. Uh, expensive water, but. And I just heard uh, at this last conference, uh, it costs for a gallon of gas in Afghanistan from the U.S. costs $400. <laughs> And I was, I, and when after I read about that, I was wondering whether you could do it with seawater. And you've answered my question. It took 20 years to get there, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of chicken littles in the world are going to be out of business. Yes, yeah. because you know people are saying, "Oh, we've pushed ag as far as we can go." Well, obviously, we can go another order of magnitude. I, I think so. Yeah, like I say, I'm, I'm opening up Pandora's box. I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. Yeah. Um, Amazing to to do this. And again, I'm not competing with traditional ag. I'm trying. No. Offset and, 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 and augment that. Um, if you get off of the um, deep seawater pipe, what do you use as another source? Let's say you have. You know, I will use fresh water. I'll generate from a, 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 a portable unit to fill up my system. And then I'll use solar thermal to run a closed loop with a chiller. And then the chiller do a closed loop with my system. Okay? So two closed loops, one with the energy part and one with the coal generation part. And now that uh, allows me to get off the grid. And, you did, and the second question is, um, you didn't talk too much about the economics of uh, different lines and all that. And a lot of the economics uh, hasn't been worked out because I haven't been able to do a commercial scale protocol. And that's the biggest, one of my biggest problems right now. Um, I have been able to do some economics on growing ahead of lettuce just by new pines. And it comes out to be about seven cents a head. So that's pretty good. Yeah, so. Why is it that cold roots have warm roots in the past year? Spring. Uh, it comes back down to the photosynthesis cycle in ATP and ADP. Okay? If you look at the photosynthesis cycle, it has carbon, and it's got sunlight, and it's got water, and it makes sugars, and, and it makes plant tissue plus heat on the equation. All this is plus heat, okay? If you can take heat away, you can actually drive that equation further. It allows the plants to offset that heat stress. And, and by not having heat stress, you're now able to grow fast. But you can get cold temperatures down the roots, so the photosynthesis is actually moving. That's correct, okay? The other aspect is what Sandy Labs just came out on Say it right here first is that Sandia Lab has done it on a micro level and finding out what's going on at the root zone. Water, if it's colder, is denser and heavier. However, capillary action supersedes that on a microscopic level. The plants are actually able to close their roots from being cooler and get better capillary action. So that works in hand in hand. If I'm saying I'm trying to speed up the equation from one end to the other, taking moving the heat and allowing photosynthesis to go faster, I also have to provide the nutrients for that to happen faster. So it's that action plus what Sandia came up with. This theoretical and people they like actually it. measured it. They were able to measure it. And they're going to come out with it in uh, general plant physiology next year. So they're looking at going to the next level and doing the second phase to look at that. what's happening at that microscopic molecular level. So phosphate is a big one for, for this whole thing. Without a phosphate system down, phosphate's the, the battery of photosynthesis. Any other questions? Yep. Yes, on the Green dome type of system. Uh, how much water can you get, or how big 
the unit, how much water can you get? How much energy does it take? I can get an inch volume of, out of every square inch of space off the heat exchanger. So if the, if the heat exchanger was an acre in size, I can make an, at one tier, I can make an acre inch of water. Okay? If I stacked them up 12 high, acre size, I can make a foot of water a day at our ambient temperature for the meter here. So that's 326,000 gallons per day per acre of heat exchanging surface area. That's free energy for the sun? <clears throat> if you're using sun and solar energy to run the cooling part, yes. Now that might take three acres of, of land. <laughs> okay. Oh, so, yeah, how, how much Separate. energy? How much energy does it take for that? Is, that that was what the prototype in California is supposed to find out. How much is it? Because it's going to vary based on their dew point. Yeah. If their dew point's really low, it's going to take more energy to, to produce less, less water, mm -hmm. and that's and that's a big problem. I'm um, working with a company in Australia that has a technology of, of using um, anhydrates to actually double humidity in closed rooms. So that's that's a technology that we're looking at coupling with that. Yeah. You mentioned uh, utilizing the, the space for the KOA solar power is yeah. like the parking lot. Yeah. Is there any um, as far as like EPA goes of when that might come together? There uh, the person who's who's hoping to take over that is still negotiating with NOHA right now. Um, their plans is to do total curtail actually on the on that side. Um, I'm trying to convince them to not take down all of solar thermal plants and actually put up, or keep some up, or until some solar close with the solar system. Because I think once that's shown, that's going to open up a whole other avenue for me um, and the technology, because I can go down to the cheapest land available in, in Hawaii and start an ag farm. I believe you said there's six milliliters of water per cubic meter of atmosphere. Yeah, roughly. At 60% humidity. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. So it's about 10 milliliters at 100. It was 100. Yeah, if it's okay. Yeah. I, I, I've been trying to find that number for 10 years. I, yeah. And the closest I came up with was, was half that. So. Yeah. But that means that there's gallons of water in the air just above this table. Literally. Up to 30,000 feet. You know, yeah. it's literally. literally up. There's water. Yeah. There's huge amounts. Huge amounts. Huge amounts. Of water. It's just very diverse. Yeah, and and. The higher the dew point temperature, the less energy it takes to get it. Okay. Hence, dew point systems. <laughs> amazing. It was truly amazing. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, All right. Thank you much again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please stick around, have some drinks and some poo poos, and uh, conversation. I'd like to recruit you.